shorter service because of the fumes, but we still going to have a little bit of a service here. Lord God, we thank praise you here. You, we give Jesus you the praise. We thank you for this Jesus opportunity, name. Lord God. Thank we ask you, Lord, to be here Lord, in the midst of us, Lord Jesus. God. We thank you, Lord, for your spirit, for your word, for your goodness, Lord God. Oh, we seek you, Lord, here tonight. We ask you, Lord, to come. In Let us feel your Jesus. presence. Hallelujah. Lord, transform us, Lord, by the renewing of our mind, Lord, and we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Praise Hallelujah. the Lord, everyone. Hallelujah. So for those that are, that are watching us streaming tonight, if you're doing that, um, the explanation for the fumes is we're having some work done outside the church, and the fumes from that product are inside. So we are going to shorten the service because of that. And we're going to take the kids upstairs, moms, instead of down when it's time for children's church. We're just going to do a few songs, and Brother Craig will take the service, and we'll go upstairs. Amen? Praise the Lord. So grab your songbooks. We're going to do a couple of songbook songs tonight before we dismiss the kids upstairs. Amen? Amen. going to be happy, but we know that you can have the joy and peace of God through the direst of circumstances. Amen. Praise the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. As I journey through the land, singing as I go, pointing souls to Calvary, to the crimson flow, many arrows pierce my soul but my Lord leads me on, through him I must win. Oh, I want to see him look upon his face. There to sing forever of his saving grace. On the streets of glory, let me lift my voice. Cares all past, home at last, ever to 
close to him, he will give me life. Satan's snares may vex my soul, turn my thoughts aside. But my Lord goes to heaven and leads my every time. Oh, I want to see him look upon his face. Let us sing forever of his saving grace. On the streets of glory, let me lift my voice. Cares all past, home at last, ever to rejoice. Oh, I want to see him look upon his face. Let us sing forever of his saving grace. On the streets of glory, let me lift my voice. Here's our past, home at last, ever to rejoice. When in valleys low I look toward the mountain high, and behold my Savior there, leading in a fight, with the tender hand outstretched toward the valley low. Guiding me, I can see as I onward go. Oh, I want to see him look upon his face. And um, so he, Brother Weeks, Sister Weeks' brother passed away unexpectedly. He was in his 50s. Uh, Tremaine was very close to him. This has been a hard blow to the family, so we want to pray for the Weeks family, help them. And then also Ruth Freeze, I think we're, we lifted her up. She has had cancer in the past, got ahead of it. Now it's come back. And I think it's a little worse than it was before, so we want to lift up Ruth Freeze, and we want to lift up the Weeks family, amen. So let's do that right now. Lord God, we're asking your strength, your power, Lord God, your comfort, Lord. You said you'd be the comforter, Lord. We're asking you, Lord, to be a comfort to the Weeks family, Lord God, in this circumstance. Lord, you're the one that's got the time. Our times are in your hand, Lord God. We come before you, Lord God. Ask you, Lord, to give them understanding. 
Give them comfort, Lord. Help them to learn, Lord God. Help them understand that you understand their afflictions, Lord God. And you're afflicted in our afflictions, Lord God. We praise you. We're asking, Lord, for healing for Sister Ruth Freeze, Lord God, for strength in their family. Lord, we're asking you, Lord, to move in a mighty way, Lord God. Your mercy, your goodness, your grace upon her, Lord God, and their family, Lord God. Lord, and the daughters that are there, Lord God, we're praising you, Lord God. Lord, we're talking, we're asking by that blood that you shed, that by your stripes we're healed, Lord God. Let your healing virtue work for Ruth Freeze here right now in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen, amen. You may be seated here tonight. We're going to ask Brother Stephen come and help us receive an offering here tonight. Hallelujah. Thank you. Lord God, I want to thank you for this time in your presence, Lord, that we might seek you and learn of you. As we bring these tithes and these offerings to your storehouse, O oh Lord, I pray that you'd bless it and sanctify it, that this gospel message might be spread. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you. And we apologize for the fumes, okay? They've been working on the piping, the drainage outside, and they coated the cinder block walls on the back. And we had no idea that we would smell these fumes inside here. It's even stronger in the basement. So we're going to try to keep this a little shorter here tonight, just, you know, for the sake of that, because it's, they're not really great fumes to be breathing. Amen. But we're going to be looking at the oneness of God, and we're going to be talking about probably just the name of Jesus tonight. We're going to talk about Jesus, the name of Jesus and his prayer, but we're just probably going to talk, cover the first part here tonight, amen, just because we're trying to keep it a little bit shorter. So Matthew 1, 21 through 23, and even, even our subject on the name of Jesus is an abbreviated uh, lesson on it, because we could spend a whole lesson just on that. But Matthew 1, 22 and 23, 21 through 23, she shall bring forth a son, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, shall bring forth a son, they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then in Acts 4 and 12, in Acts 4 and 12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. And if you go back to verse 10, you find out that it's talking about Jesus Christ. And then we want to look at Colossians 3 and 17. And Colossians 3 and 17 says, And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Amen. So, Talking about the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus means Jehovah is salvation. This comes from the Greek Jesus, and the Greek Jesus comes from the Hebrew name Joshua or Jehoshua, which according to Brown Drivers Briggs Concordance of the Old Testament means Jehovah is salvation. So the name Jesus really boils down to Jehovah is salvation. When we look in Acts 7.45, the name Jesus is used, but it's really talking about Joshua in the Old Testament. So we look over there, Acts 7.45, it says, which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles whom God drave out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David. And what's talking about, the, they brought the tabernacle in with them. 
So it's saying Jesus, but it means Joshua because Jesus wasn't back there when they came in and conquered the land of Canaan, but Joshua was the one that led them during that conquest. And in Hebrews 4 and 8, again, we see the same idea, same concept. In Hebrews 4 and 8, it says, For if Jesus had given them rest, then he would not afterwards have spoken of another day. In other words, if Joshua had taken care of every problem that needed to be taken care of in the land of Canaan when they came in to conquest everything, then they wouldn't have needed to speak about another day where God is going to come and bring labor there or bring deliverance. And so the point is, is, that shows us the relationship between the Old Testament name of Joshua and the New Testament name Jesus because those two scriptures are obviously talking about Joshua of the Old Testament, but the Greek translates it into the name Jesus, so that lets us know that Joshua in the Old Testament is equal to Jesus in the New Testament as far as the name is concerned, not as far as the person, obviously. So the name Jesus means Jehovah is salvation. Now, if you think about that for a little bit, to me, that's a revelation right there of who God is. All right? It, it's telling us that the God of the Old Testament has now become our Savior. Amen? And so that's an important point. Okay, into the name of Jesus, it reveals the invisible God. They said, we can't see God unless God makes himself visible. But even if he does that, it's a temporary manifestation. They usually call it a theophany because God doesn't just haphazardly make himself visible. If God makes himself visible, he's got a point or a reason he's trying to bring out when he does that. So... Jesus is the permanent revelation of the invisible God. So let's look at some of these scriptures that are up there. Okay, John 1 and 1. So John 1 and 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then you go down to verse 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So God, the invisible God, became visible in the flesh of Jesus Christ. And again, I want to call, it, call your attention to John 1 and 1. It says, in the beginning was the word. It does not say, in the beginning was the Son, and the Son was with God. Although there's a lot of people, when they read it, that's what their thinking is. So they don't understand because of what they've been taught. They actually are replacing words in their mind with concepts. But it doesn't say in the beginning was the Son and the Son was with God and the, and the Son was God. It does not say that. It says in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God. The Word cannot be separated from God. A, a person's word is not somebody else's person's word, right? So God's word belongs to his person, himself, him alone, okay? And so what it's saying is God's plan, God's idea, God's thought was with him in the beginning. And again, as we studied scriptures in these lessons, we saw that God had a plan from the foundation of the world. He had a plan before he said, let there be light, to, bring a, to, to be a savior, to have a lamb slain from the foundation of the world, to gather all things together in Christ. God had this plan. This is part of his word. So the word is with God. It is God. It's God spoken. It's God's thought. It's God's idea. It's God's plan. But then verse 14 says, God's plan now becomes flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. John 8, 58, one of my favorite scriptures, which to me has always been a rock-solid scripture that tells us 
Jesus was saying he is the God of the Old Testament. Because John 8, 58 says, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. I love that scripture. Okay, he's telling them, I'm the one that was speaking to Moses out of the burning bush. That's what Jesus is saying. Before Abraham was, I am. Not I was, I am. Now, I am means I always exist. So he's not saying I just existed before Abraham. He's saying before Abraham came into being, I've always been. I am. So he's saying, and he's telling He's telling us, and this is why they want to stone him in the next verse. It says they take up stones. Then they took up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple going through the midst of them, so passed by. Why did they want to stone him? They wanted to stone him because they only know one I am. They only know one, one I am. And by Jesus saying, I'm, I am the I am, they recognize he's claiming to be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God that spoke to Moses in the burning bush. So this goes on through the, through the Gospel of John. If you study the Gospel of John, this is an ongoing dispute throughout the Gospel. In John 10 and 30, again, Jesus says, I and my Father are one. Did he just mean one in unity, one in purpose, you know, one in the same team? No, the Jews understood that he meant, I'm claiming to be your God. Because the next verse says, then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, many good works have I showed you from my father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him saying, for good work. We stone thee not, but for blasphemy, because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. So the Bible is telling us clearly that Jesus' statement of I and my Father are one, the, the Jews understood that as claiming to be God. We're not reading into it. We're telling you what the Bible says about that. Again, in John 12 and 44, Jesus, Jesus is talking again, and he says, Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. I'm come as a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. But he just said two verses earlier, Believing on me, you're not really believing on me, you're believing on him that sent me. So I'm coming on light that you might believe me, that you might believe who I really am. I'm God, I'm the Father manifest in the flesh. This is what he's trying to bring out. Then, then he really explains it to his disciples on the night of the Last Supper. Jesus comes out and really explains it to them in John 14 and 6. Jesus says unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. Now, I've met Tim's father and Matt's father and Stephen's father and Mark's father, okay? But if I had met him, I wouldn't be able to tell you what they looked like just by looking at them. But Jesus is saying, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Okay? And then Philip in verse 8 says unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it suffices us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, yet thou hast not known me, Philip, he that has seen me has seen the Father. How sayest thou then, show us the Father? So what Jesus is really saying is, Philip, after all you've seen, don't you get it? Don't you understand who I really am? How can you say, show us? 
who you are. Show us the Father. I've been showing you. I am the Father with all the things I've been doing. Then he says in verse 10, Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. What he's saying is the eternal Spirit of God that is housed, incarnated in the body of that man, Jesus Christ, who is both God and man. It's the eternal spirit that is doing the works. Praise God. Amen. John 20, 28. Even though Jesus, this is like us. We come to church, we hear things, and sometimes a year later or two years later or a week later, all of a sudden we go, ding. We understand what we heard, okay? Apostles were the same way. Jesus told them all that stuff on the night of the Last Supper. That means Thomas was there, right? But later on in, in, in John 20, Jesus appears and Thomas is not there. And the other disciples later on tell Thomas, we saw the Lord. Thomas says, unless I see the nail prints in his hands and put my hand in his side, I'm not going to believe it. And so then Jesus shows up eight days later and Jesus tells him in 20, verse 27, reach hither your fingers and your hand, put in my side, put in the hand. Thomas doesn't reach. When he sees Jesus alive from the dead, his expression or his exclamation is in verse 28. Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God. Again, he, this is a Jew. They don't have any divisions in God. There's no idea that there's persons in the Godhead. If they had an idea of persons in the Godhead, they wouldn't have been trying to stone Jesus for saying he was God. That would have been acceptable. So they had no idea of persons in the Godhead. And so for Thomas to say that, all of a sudden, the words that Jesus said on the last night of the Last Supper click. The only way this man can be standing here with these holes in his hand and this hole in his side is if he is, in fact, God. Hallelujah. Let's give him a little praise. Lord, we thank you, Lord God, and we praise you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. We magnify you. We thank you, Lord, for your love, Lord God. We thank you for your wisdom, Lord God. Hallelujah. Then in Colossians 1 and 15, Apostle Paul tells us that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Colossians 1 and 15, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Now remember, God was constantly saying, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that's in the heaven, above, in the earth, or in the waters under the earth. Don't make any graven image. Why? Because anything we would make would not really adequately represent the divine, the holy, eternal, sinless God. But now Paul says Jesus is the image of the invisible God. The only way that can be is if he is that God himself. Amen. Again, in Hebrews 1 and 3. It was talking about Jesus again. And it says, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. So in other words, he's not just an image. He's the express image of God's person, the very image of God's person, upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And again, we said that that right hand relationship had to do with the priesthood, and me, being a mediator to humanity and represented the place of honor and the highest place of exaltation of a human being in creation. Okay, this is what this right hand of majesty means. 
But the point is, the name of Jesus reveals the invisible God. Right, we go back to John 14 and 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man, not most men, no man comes to the Father but by me. If you're going to find out who the Father is, you've got to find out who Jesus is first. And, and he actually said that in a couple other places. You go to Matthew eleven twenty-seven. 27. He said it in a little bit different way in Matthew eleven twenty-seven. 27. In Matthew eleven twenty-seven, 27, Jesus has got a little conversation going on, and he says in verse 27, All things are delivered unto me of my Father. And no, no, no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father, save or except the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. So in other words, if I want to find out who the Father really is, I need to get a revelation from Jesus Christ. Amen. This is repeated in Luke 10 and 22. Luke 10 and 22 says a little more straightforward, okay? It says, all things are delivered me of my Father, to me of my Father, and no man knows who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. So, it's not just a one-off scripture, is it? It's something that's repeated, letting us understand that God intends us to understand. I need, you need, we need a revelation from God to really understand who the Father is. This is why a lot of times people do struggle with oneness and trinity, because you need a revelation. And I think I've told that story that Sister Joan Ruder used to tell when her uncle, George Cook, used to pastor the church there in Foxborough, they had a family, a husband and wife, that were coming, and everybody was trying to teach them about the oneness. They were giving them scriptures, and the pastor was, and Sister Joan was, and other people, and nothing was happening. And all of a sudden, one night they came into service, or one morning, or one, they came into service one day, and they said, we just got a revelation that God is one. How come you guys never told us? you needed a revelation, okay? So I, when jo Sister Joan told that story, I said that just illustrates to me the reality that people do need a revelation. Sometimes it comes easy to some people, but some people really struggle with it. Now, Jesus is the only saving name, which is another reason why you don't need to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, because none of those other things are going to help you get saved. Right? If I want to get saved, I need the name of Jesus. Okay, I need a name. I need a name. Father's not a name. Holy Ghost is not a name. If I want, want to get saved, it's the only saving name. So we see in, in Matthew 1 and 21 that Mary and Joseph are not allowed to choose the name. God chooses the name. So in Matthew 1 and 21, the angel tells Joseph, and she shall bring forth the son, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Okay? He, he needs this name because of who he is and what he's going to do. We already saw that the name of Jesus means Jehovah is salvation. Amen. So God's saying, this is the name of the child. You're not going to pick it. Amen. It doesn't matter how much you pray. I'm going to give it to you. This is what the name is because of who this child is going to be. It's the only saving name. And then we go to the book of Acts, where we already read, Acts 4.10 through 12. In Acts 4.10 through 12, we read Acts 4.12. Peter and John, they're, they're talking. They're talking to the, the scribes and the Pharisees, and they've said, do not teach in the name 
of Jesus, okay? They're, they're trying to get him not to teach in that. But Peter says to them, Be it known unto you and all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which the builders set it not, which was set it not of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That's why it's important how you're baptized. You need the right name to be saved. Hallelujah. Praise God. So the name's given by God. The apostles preach it's the only name that works for salvation. Again, remittance of sin, remission of sins comes through the name of Jesus. So Luke 24, 46. Luke 24, 46, and he said unto them, Thus it is written, Thus it behoove Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name. Whose name? Jesus Christ's name, right? That's what it's saying. That repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name, meaning the name of Jesus Christ among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, it's not just for the Jews, it's for all nations, it says. Not just for some. I mean, you get, you get people that, that's one of the ways they try to dismiss baptism in Jesus' name. It's just for the Jews, because they crucified him, so they got to take the name. Now, here it says, remission of sins in the name of Jesus Christ for all nations. Praise God. Amen. Again, Acts chapter 10, verse 38 through 43 Peter is preaching. Peter's preaching to the household of Cornelius, and he speaks about how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost, with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are his witnesses of all these things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to judge the quick and the dead. And to him give all prophets witness that through his name, Whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Now, I'm going to tell you, remission of sins is not the same as forgiveness of sins. So some places in the Bible you see forgiveness of sins. Some places in the Bible you see the word remission. If you look up the Greek, it's the same Greek word. But I'm going to say to you, if it was the same, it meant the same thing, why didn't the translators always use the same word? They didn't use the same word because they understood remission means freedom from. I can be forgiven for what I did, but not be free from it. A person can go murder somebody, go to prison. The family can show up and say, we forgive you, but the guy's still in prison. Same thing with our sins. I've got to be free from sin, and only baptism in the name of Jesus is going to free your sins, free you from your sins. That's why a lot of people can get the Holy Ghost and fall back out. A lot of people can, can come to God and have an experience, but they, can't, they don't stay in God because they don't get baptized the right way. They're not really free from their sins. Okay, and you can look it up in the Strong's Concordance if you got one. It'll tell you it means freedom from. It's important. So again, eternal life through the name of Jesus. 
So we're at John 20 and 31. John 20, 31, it says, these are written. These what? The, the previous 20 chapters. These are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. And we didn't, we didn't go, I don't have all these scriptures because we could go in the name of Jesus is the name for healing, right? We could go into the name of Jesus is what you use to cast out devils. You don't get any devils cast out in the name of the Father or cast out in the name of the Holy Ghost. They're not coming out. So you want devils come out in the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God. So you can go on and on and on, okay, in the name of Jesus. It's the only name. And if you didn't need a name, why does he say this, that through believing in this name, you might have eternal life? It's the person of Jesus Christ. So we're talking about the name of Jesus. So Jesus is the Jehovah of the Old Testament. As we already said, Jesus means Jehovah Savior or Jehovah is Savior. Now look at Isaiah 44 and 6. It's up there on the screen. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Beside me there is no God. This is God in the Old Testament saying this. He's saying, I'm the King of Israel. He's saying, I'm the Redeemer. I'm the first and the last. And where you see the word Lord in capitals in that verse, it's really the word Jehovah. It's the Hebrew word Jehovah. So we could read it, thus saith the Jehovah, the King of Israel, the Redeemer, the Jehovah, the hosts, I am the first and I am the last, beside me there is no God. So in the Old Testament, Jehovah is the King of Israel, he's the Redeemer, he's the first and last. In the New Testament, John 149, they say, we found the King of Israel. Galatians 3 and 13, Jesus redeemed us from the curse of of the law. He's our Redeemer. Revelation 1 and 8, Jesus said, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. You can't have two Redeemers. You can't have two kings. You can't have two first and last. Amen. And since it was Jehovah in the Old Testament and Jesus means Jehovah is salvation, what does that mean? That just means God put on flesh. God allowed himself to be born into this world as a man to be our king, to be our savior, to be our redeemer, to be our first, and to be our last. Hallelujah. Amen. So we're going to stop there for tonight because we're trying to go short, not long, and let's pray. Lord God, your own word says that it takes a revelation to understand this. Lord, we're praying, bring the revelation to people. God, we're praying, bring the revelation and the understanding, Lord God. You're the one that says that no man can come to you, Lord, except you draw them, Lord God. No man can know the Father but by you and through you, Lord God. Lord, we're praying for the revelation of that name, the revelation of who you are, Lord God. Lord, that all the confusion can be removed, Lord, and people can come to the salvation that you've ordained, we pray. And we give you the praise here tonight. We give you the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. Amen. You're dismissed in the name of the Lord. God bless you.